One of the things I enjoy about living in Cape Town is being close to Table Mountain. Since the start of this year, I've done five hikes on Table Mountain, about one a month, and three of those have been five-hour hikes. Um, on the 1st of January, my daughter and I uh, did a walk right above the college here. We went up from Rhodes Memorial to the Upper Traverse, which is a high route around this side of the mountain. And then we went around the backside towards Devil's Peak, up over what's called Minor Peak, across the knife's edge, which looks down a couple hundred meters into the waterfall, first waterfall ravine, and then down over Mowbray Ridge and back to Rhodes Mem. Um, last weekend, uh, a couple weekends ago, I did a hike from Camps Bay up Castile's Port and then down the pipe track, or the jeep track rather, to Constantia Neck with some friends, and that was another five hour hike. I, whenever I do those hikes, I always do it with a goal in mind. And sometimes I focus a little bit too much on the goal and not enough on the experience. My goal is to reach somewhere, to reach a height, to reach a destination, to, to make a loop and finish, finish the course. And usually it's within a certain amount of time. And so I'm keeping an eye on my watch. But I do those hikes and enjoy those hikes because I have the hope of accomplishing something, even if it's just to get there and back again. And in a sense, when we talk about the hope, as we did last week, as we talk about the God of hope, we're, we're looking at a, a picture, if you will, of the future, a picture of something that is out there waiting for us. And this morning, as we move on from last week, I'd like us to focus on that picture that, that Scripture presents for us. In other words, we saw last week that, that God is one, God is the God of hope who makes often ridiculous and outlandish promises to his people and then fulfills them. But with each of those hopes and the fulfillment of those hopes, there was often a remainder, something that was left over, something that wasn't quite fulfilled as the people expected it to be. And that remainder kept pointing to a future fulfillment. And what we see in Scripture is that that future fulfillment takes on a life of its own, so to speak. That there is a great final consummation that's portrayed in Scripture when God will bring all those hopes to fulfillment. A final consummation, if you will, of all the hopes that we see in Scripture. And there are a number of places in Scripture where we see that hope expressed, often using symbolic or metaphorical language. And I'd like us to take a look at a couple of those because I think they help inform us about the nature of that hope and what it is that we have to look forward to. The hope that we find in the Old Testament among the Hebrews is the same hope, really, that is found in the New Testament among the Christian believers. They often use very similar language. The Christians often borrowed the language from the Old Testament to, to convey that hope to a new generation. But I'd like us to begin with one of the prophets. And I suppose it's not surprising that the, the expression of that kind of future hope comes to us largely through the prophetic imagination. The prophets represent a time in Israel's history when things were rather topsy-turvy, when Israel wasn't doing so well, by and large, when Israel was a small pawn in, among the nations that were vying for domination, and often the, the, the losing side of that whole process. And it's in that context that we come to um, one of the prophets, Isaiah, and an expression of that hope in Isaiah chapter 11. The hope begins with the arrival of an anointed leader, a Messiah, if you will, but moves on to describe a situation that defies everything we presently know about biology and zoology. Let me read what he says, beginning with chapter 11, verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, 
the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. That's where we see the anointing, the spirit resting upon this leader who will rise up, this root, uh, root from the stump of Jesse. And then it goes on to describe this leader. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will de give decisions for the poor of the earth. Think about the rulers of this world. How many of them would that picture describe? They don't judge by what they see with their eyes or what they hear with their ears, but they judge with righteousness for the needy. And with justice, give decisions for the poor of the earth. How many of our rulers of this world are really concerned about the poor and the needy of the world? What Isaiah is describing here is something unusual at least, perhaps unique. He goes on and he says, He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. And this is where it now gets a little bit uh, interesting from a biological and zoolog zoological perspective. Isaiah continues, The wolf will lie down with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 9. The images presented here defy everything we know about the normal relationship between carnivores and herbivores the latter of whom are usually a key ingredient in the food chain for the former. Wolves eat lambs, leopards eat goats, lions eat calves, and bears eat cows. The idea of lions eating straw, like oxen, would require a complete overhaul, not only of the lion's mouth and its teeth, but of its whole digestive system. And the thought of children, even infants, leading lions as they lead calves or playing near the cobra's den is enough to send shivers down our spine. I have a two-year-old grandson and an almost one-month-old grandson, and to think of either of them playing near the cobra's den, it, it, it's not a pleasant thought. Obviously, Isaiah is using language symbolically here. But we have to ask ourselves, what's the point of the picture that he is painting? I would suggest the point of it all comes to us in the final verse, where he says, they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. The images of this text point to a future in which the natural forces of destruction are overcome by the knowledge and presence of the Lord. In other words, it's a hope for a future characterized by righteousness, justice, and peace in the presence of the Lord. That's the ultimate hope that Isaiah holds out for his people. This hope for a radically different future is expressed in many different ways in Scripture. But a similar view is expressed at the end of Isaiah, Isaiah 65, where the poet, the prophet, speaks of a new heaven and a new earth. 
beginning with verse 17 of chapter 65, we read, See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight, and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying. <clears throat> Excuse me. The sound of weeping and, cry and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. And then, doesn't this sound familiar? The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my mountain, all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Again, a picture of a reality that's very different from our present realities. A picture of blessing, a picture of longevity, a picture of abundance, of fruitfulness, of of no misfortune, of no harm, of no destruction. The picture that Isaiah is presenting here is a picture that goes beyond anything we've ever experienced, anything the, the earth has ever experienced. Although he describes it focused on Jerusalem and Jerusalem being this kind of place, Jerusalem's never been that kind of place. All through its history, this kind of promise has never been fulfilled. And he's pointing to I think we have to recognize that he's pointing to a future that is beyond. Beyond the present futures that are part of our current, rea current reality, our current history. <clears throat> the prophet Zephaniah also seems to, at times, blur the line between a picture of a, a, a future in history and a future that reaches beyond history. When he promises restoration to Israel in chapter 3 of his book, he writes, Then I will purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. I'm skipping through a few verses here just to highlight a few things. On that day, you, Jerusalem, will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me, because I will remove from you your arrogant boasters. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill. So God deals finally with pride and removes it entirely. But I will leave within you the meek and the humble, the remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. Sing, daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter of Zion. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. And he continues on in a similar vein, saying that he will remove from Israel 
all forms of wrong, all forms of suffering, all forms of evil. At that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. So the, the prophet Zephaniah looks forward to a time, not just of restoration for Israel, but a time in which all things are made right, where all wrongs are finally eliminated. And note, it happens in verse, uh, in, in verse 15 that I read there, the Lord the king of Israel is with you. It happens when God comes to be present with his people. It's really a, a vision, if you will, for the future indwelling presence of God with his people. Another prophet, Zechariah, looked forward to a great day when the Lord would intervene on behalf of his people. And he described that day in chapter 14 in these words, On that day there will be neither sunlight nor cold, frosty darkness. It will be a unique day, a day known only to the Lord, with no distinction between day and night. When evening comes, there will be light. On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it east to the Dead Sea and half of it west to the Mediterranean Sea, in summer and in winter. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. Again, it's a picture of, of God coming and establishing his presence among his people in such a way that there's no longer day or night. He is their light. There's no longer a lack of water in a land that is known for being an arid land. But there's now water flowing from Jerusalem, which is a high point, flowing down to the Dead Sea on the one side, flowing down to the Mediterranean Sea on the other side. It's a vision of abundance, of fruitfulness, because God is there, because God is present. In the New Testament, the same hope is expressed in similar language. In fact, in some cases, even in the same language, particularly in the book of Revelation. John's picture of the final consummation of all things sounds very Isianic, if we may say that. He writes in chapter 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And in fact, in the NIV, it's in quotation marks because they recognize it's coming from Isaiah 65. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. It's an interesting comment. There was no longer any sea. The sea in, in the Hebrew mindset represented largely chaos, that which was uncontrollable and uncontrolled. And so in John's vision, the sea is done away with entirely. Now, some fishermen might not like that, but, but again, he's using symbolic language to portray the idea that God is in control. God has established his rule, his, his reign over the earth. He continues, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Do you see John's vision there? A vision of all things becoming new. Of God doing a new thing. 
of God doing something so radically different from what we've experienced in this history that he struggles to even describe it adequately. He struggles with the language. He has to use symbol. He has to use metaphor. He has to use images to try to portray this new thing that God is doing. But there are common themes here in, this, in these pictures of the future. God has promised his people something new, a new heaven and a new earth, a new dispensation that does away with pain, sorrow, tears, and even death itself. A future in which God is present and in which his presence makes all things new. This sounds like a wonderful hope, and in many respects it is. We could describe it as the divine embrace, the hope of being fully present with God, our maker, our redeemer, our empower. That's the hope. That's the final destination that the biblical writers hold out for us as God's future to which we're aiming. So if if we go back to the metaphor of climbing Table Mountain. That's that's the mountaintop. That's the destination to which we're headed. However, this hope for a blessed future is not the whole story. In many of the texts that speak about this future, there are also disturbing images of quite a different future. Jesus painted a sharp contrast between a future of blessedness and a future punishment in a parable he told in Matthew 25, one that we're familiar with as the parable of the sheep and the goat, goats. If you recall that parable, he begins by saying that in the last day when the Son of Man returns, he will divide the people before his throne and put some on his left and some on his right, and the ones on the right he compares to the sheep, and the ones on the left he compares to goats. And then he turns to the sheep and he says, welcome into my blessedness, essentially. And when they say, well, what did we do that we should be so blessed? He says, well, when I was hungry, you fed me, etc., etc." You're all familiar with the text, I believe. And they say, when did we do that? And he says, in, the least, in that you did it for the least of these, my brothers, you did it for me. And then picking up the story, the parable from verse 41 of chapter 25, he says, then he will say to those on his left, i.e. the goats, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment but the righteous to eternal life. There are many theologians and church leaders today who argue that God will ultimately bring all people into his presence. That that positive hope that we were talking about earlier is the hope for the whole world. And that ultimately God can only be God if he embraces all. There are some who argue for that in a rather simple way. Um, There's a popular book currently by the title Love Wins, which I think at least raises those questions, even if it doesn't convincingly argue for that position. There are others who've taken a much more sophisticated approach to that argument and have said, well, we need to rethink how we define justification Our understanding of justification is the problem. And if we would only understand justification as really meaning God's 
unconditional acceptance of the unacceptable, then we wouldn't have a problem recognizing that in the end, all are accepted into God's presence. And whilst I appreciate what such theologians and church leaders have to say and their perspectives on these things, and I, I really do wish that I could accept that kind of a hope as my own, I just don't find that those kind of views deal adequately with what we see in Scripture. For example, in the parable that I just read, how do, we, how do I reconcile the, the universal salvation of all with Jesus' pretty clear telling of this parable? In fact, it wasn't only in Jesus' teachings that we find that. I think uh, some have pointed out that, that Jesus, more than anyone else in the New Testament, speaks about the issue of, of eternal punishment. Excuse me. But the other authors also speak about it. In fact, if we go back to the text that we were reading earlier uh, from the book of Revelation, where we saw the, the image of a new heaven and a new, er, and new, new heavens and a new earth, the seer continues in verse 6. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost, from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. A fairly strong warning. I, immediate, I, I, would, I would immediately remind us that Paul, when he writes similar language to the Corinthians, quickly adds, and such were some of you. <laughs> that is, he reminds them that, that grace can transform anyone, as we saw in the song and the, and the dance that we had at the beginning this morning. And I certainly don't want to discount that in any way. But the picture of this contrast between, if we may call it divine embrace and divine exclusion, is a pretty strong one. The 14th century Italian poet, Dante, captured the essence of this threat in his classic poem, Inferno. You may be aware that Dante wrote actually three books, a trilogy, the first of which was Inferno, as he, as he told the story in, in poetic language of himself, a vision he had of himself descending down into the depths of hell. Nine different levels, as he reckoned it in his day, the beginning of the 14th century. But when he gets to the very bottom, he finds an, a, a gate leading into the pit of hell. And above that gate, there's an inscription, if you will, welcoming those who would enter. And the sign above the, above the gates of hell says simply this, abandon all hope, you who enter here. And I think Dante captured correctly that the image of hell is one which is not just a lack of hope, but it's an abandonment of hope. It's despair, if you will. It's the opposite of that image that we've been talking about. And the parable of the sheep and the goats that Jesus told of those facing a frightening future, as well as those facing a blessed future, is, is capturing an important part of the gospel story. Again, one that we don't hear as much about today or don't like to think about very much. In Dante's poem, it wasn't that God was punishing people by sending them there. It was rather that 
that was the place reserved for those who continued to exclude God from their lives. In other words, it was the final reward, if you will, for the choices that they had made. And I think the, the parable that Jesus told points in the same direction. That the people, the goats that he addresses, are those who had the opportunity to make a difference in the lives of others. But they chose rather to live for themselves, to ignore the needs of those around them. As we consider these scriptures, I believe we're left with a vital choice to make. The question is simply, will we align ourselves with the ultimate hope for a future with God, a future of enjoying the fullness of his presence by aligning ourselves with his purposes and mission in the concrete realities of our daily existence? Or will we choose to ignore God's call and God's purposes for our life and in so doing, choose exclusion from God rather than the embrace of God. The choice we're talking about here is not merely a choice of life and death. It is much more than that. It's really a choice with eternal consequences. It is choosing to live already in the newness of life that God offers through the power of the Spirit, focused not on our own needs and wants, but on how God has designed us to serve others. This is the choice God calls each of us to make. And I would suggest it's a, a choice we make not just once, but it's a choice we make in many respects on a daily basis. If you have any doubts about where you stand on such a choice, let me encourage you to discuss the matter with me or with one of my colleagues here at Cornerstone. But the consistent emphasis in scripture, whenever there is an eschatological focus, that's a good theological term for the, the end times, is not on the details of the future itself, not what that future will be like or how or when things will happen or what exactly is going to happen in what order. That's never the focus. The focus is on how that promised or threatened future affects the way we live in the here and now. The essential question is, how do we live now in anticipation of the coming future that God has promised? I, my colleagues, many Cornerstone students over the years have wrestled with that question. Sometimes we come up with good answers, sometimes we don't. But we've wrestled with that question. And many have chosen in different ways to live in the newness of life, finding creative ways to live out that hope. Live in anticipation of that hope of divine embrace. Next week, what I would like to do is I'd like to share with you some of the stories of how those who've gone before you as students here at Cornerstone to do that, have attempted to live with their hope for the future impacting not only their own lives, but the lives of people around them. Let's pray. Father, we recognize in the scripture that we've read this afternoon, or this morning, and in the pictures that have been painted for us from scripture, that you are the God of hope, and that you offer such a blessed future for us. You promise your own presence with us. And we just want to confess this morning that there is nothing that could be better than that. As we consider the, the challenge of these different images, the positive and the negative, and consider the choices that we must make, I pray that you give us wisdom, you give us courage, and that you give us the support of 
brothers and sisters who share the journey with us. Thank you for your grace in each of our lives. Amen.